the third uh, G. Brown Good Education Lecture Series here at the Smithsonian. And um, this is organized by the Smithsonian Center for Education and Museum Studies, uh, Stephanie Norby and Bruce Craig. Um, and to introduce the speaker today, it's also my pleasure to uh, welcome Dr. Mara Mayer, who heads uh, education here at the National Zoological Park. We're so pleased that everybody has shown up today and welcome to the Smithsonian National Zoo. We're delighted particularly to have our wonderful guest speaker today, Dr. Temple Grandin. I suspect that many of you are already very familiar with her and her work, so I'm going to keep the introduction brief. For each of us, our personal and professional lives intersect in ways that make our perspectives unique. That is exquisitely true for Temple Grandin. As you know, labeled autistic in the 1950s when she was a young child, she nevertheless, as she put it, groped her way from the far side of darkness. She described her struggle in her book, Emergence, Labeled Autistic. As Oliver Sacks said of the book, it was, quote, unprecedented because there had never been an inside narrative of autism, unthinkable because it had been medical dogma that there was no inside, that there was no inner life in the autistic, unquote. Not only did she become a spokesperson for people with autism, she also used the insights that autism provided for her to become an expert in animal care. She attributes her success in that work to her extraordinary visual memory. As she puts it, and I quote her, every design problem I've ever solved started with my ability to visualize and see the world in pictures, unquote. She compares her memory to having full-length movies in her head that can be replayed at will, allowing her to notice small details that otherwise would be missed. Her insights have been critical to her work, designing animal, animal handling facilities, enabling her to identify details to which animals are particularly sensitive. With her exceptional visualization skills, she can design thoughtful and humane equipment and environments. Her extraordinary insights and contributions to our understanding of both autism and animal welfare have brought her great public visibility and the list of where she has presented is endless. She's been on any number of TV shows from 2020 to the Today Show. She's been featured in magazines and newspapers, People and the New York Times and Forbes. She herself has personally authored over 300 articles in both scientific journals and livestock periodicals on animal handling, welfare, and facility design. We are so pleased to have her with us here today. So I can't imagine a more appropriate speaker for all of us committed both to enhancing educational opportunities and to enhancing the welfare and well-being of animals. Temple Grandin. Just take this mic off of here so I can move around a little bit because I like to move around. And I think I might just start out and just say a few things about, um, about autism. It is a neurological um, disorder that the person is born with. It varies all the way from uh, somebody who's nonverbal all the way up to a scientist like Einstein. It's a very, very broad-ranging continuum. And then there's the milder type. It's called Asperger's where the child has normal speech development. But they're just kind of the loner, the kind of odd kid. And a lot of these people, you know, were brilliant scientists. In fact, there's a very interesting book out uh, called um, Asperger's and Self-Esteem. And it's about famous scientists and musicians that probably were on the um, autism Asperger spectrum. And then about half the people on the spectrum are going to remain nonverbal. Now, to understand animal thinking, you have to get away from verbal language. The normal human mind tends to think in language, categorize things with language-based ways of categorization, which tend to override the visual thinking, the smell thinking, the touch thinking, 
the auditory thinking that we're going to share with animals. You know, some people think you have to have language to have thought. Well, if that's the case, well, then I guess I just can't think. I just can't agree with those philosophers. So what is thinking in pictures? It's literally having videotapes in my head. I think in photorealistic pictures, you know, like movies. Now, there's another kind of mind, and when you look at people on the autism Asperger spectrum, I found that you can have the visual thinking mind, like me, that thinks in pictures, is horrible at algebra because there's nothing there to visualize. There's a pattern thinker that thinks in, in patterns, in music and patterns, rather than photorealistic pictures. It tends to be bad in English. And then there's kind of a word specialist mind that just knows every single you know, weather statistic and baseball statistic. Well, both people and animals think in details because when you have sensory-based thinking, it's going to be extremely detailed. Animals notice little things that we tend to not notice. Okay, here's an entrance going into the veterinary chute at a feed yard. And look at the windmill there. On windy days, the wind's going to be turning that windmill. Also look at how dark the entrance is. And most animals, you know, the grazing animals and the carnivores and things like this are dichromats. They don't have a red sensor. They see yellow and blue. And, uh, but one of the things dichromatic vision, vision does is it makes you much more sensitive to sharp contrasts of light and dark. Okay, here's a cow's eye view into a chute. Needs to have some solid sides because look at the people you can see. Also, the grazing animals have their eyes on the side of their head so they can scan the horizon. Fear is the main motivation in grazing animals. You know, where carnivores have got their eyes in the front of the head, so they've got good depth perception. Now, on sunny days, you'll often have a lot more problems getting animals to walk over shadows and things. You may not have a problem with this on cloudy days. There can be a lot of time of day effects. Look at the shadows you've got there. There's a little piece of yellow tape on, on a pipe, you know, flapping. Get rid of those sort of things. I went out to a um, zoological uh, park uh, about a year ago, and they couldn't figure out why on some days the antelopes would go in and out of the exhibit just fine, and on other days they didn't. Well, there was a sign that um, would sometimes be leaning up against the fence, and other times it was not leaning up against the fence. It was in the middle of the alley, and it was bright yellow on the back side. And I basically said, either throw that sign away or put it up on the fence so it stays up on the fence. You know, but they didn't notice the detail, though sometimes the sign was against the fence where it didn't cause a problem, and another time the sign was out in the middle of the lane where it did cause a problem. You know, let's just get rid of it. You know, it's a very, very simple thing. And to the animal, they noticed that because it was different on different days. Now, if the sign just stayed there on the fence all the time, they would, they'd get used to it. You know, let's say you have a drain in the middle of a floor. Okay, they get used to walking over that drain. That's fine. A new animal is going to balk at that drain. An animal that's lived there for a long time just walks right over it. If the sign just stays in the same place all the time, it just sort of becomes part of the furniture. But if it's moving around, then it's going to cause a problem. Rapid movement. It makes the grazing animals run away, and it makes the carnivores want to chase. Rapid movement's very stimulating to the brain. You know, you know kind of a movement like this. A steady movement like this doesn't scare. I want to just give you a few little hints on restraining animals, whether you're restraining an animal with an apparatus or you're just holding a small animal. Make sure you fully support it. Make sure you have non-slip flooring. There's nothing worse than getting an animal in on this stainless steel veterinary table, skidding all around, panicking. Because the fear of falling is a primal fear. You must make sure you don't trigger the fear of falling. You know, support the body. Another mistake that people make is when the animal struggles, they squeeze it too hard. And they do that whether they're holding it with their hands or they're holding it with some hydraulic, you know, thing. And also, there's an optimal pressure, not too tight and not too loose. And recently, I was at a, um, at a, a, lab, at a big laboratory, and they told me about a technician there. They used to just pick up rats all the time, not by the tail, just pick them up by the body. Never got bitten, never wore gloves. She wore little rubber gloves, but rats can bite right through those. But she just um, picked them up very matter-of-factly with just the right pressure around the body, and the rats never bit. And, it had, and one of the reasons why they never bit is there was no jerky motions, or she didn't, like, sneak up and then go like this. 
She just reached in real matter-of-factly and picked them up around the body with just the right amount of pressure. And I call those my principles of restraint. Do ne never trigger the fear of falling, an optimal pressure, and no rapid jerky motion. Rapid jerky motion scares, either seeing it or feeling it. When I was a little kid, I used to love automatic doors. Like the carnivore, I was attracted to rapid motion. And I live in a world of visual detail. The dog lives in a world of smell detail. And, you know, can, just imagine the detail he gets, and he goes up to the local fire hydrant. Boy, he knows who's there, how long ago they were there, what's their ranking, is it a friend or a foe. There's a tremendous amount of information on that, on that fire hydrant. It's like going down to the local coffee shop. <laughs> now, when you think in sensory, whether it be smell, touch, auditory, or sound, you put sensory-based information into categories. That's how you can form a simple concept, things I can chase, things I'm not supposed to chase. And in working with animal training, if you want a guide dog to uh, know what to do in a strange city, you better train him on many, many different intersections. Because if you only trained him on intersections that had white lines for the crosswalk, he wouldn't know what to do if he went to an intersection that had no white lines. So you need to teach him with white lines. Curves, no curves, dirt roads. Teach him with many, many different kinds of intersections, maybe about 15 different kinds. Then he forms a category of intersections. I think it's interesting. I, you're working, you know, a lot of people with autism are very literal minded, and you need to teach them that, yes, the rule for not running across the street applies in many, many different places. You don't just teach it at home. He's got to learn well at school and at the library. You also don't run across the street. And at the mall, you don't either. Well, this is a picture that a young autistic man sent to me to show how he sorted dog and cat pictures into little file folders in his brain. And there's been some really interesting neuroscience research now that shows that brains are set up to put information into file folders. Or you can create a new file. So when I was little, I sorted dogs and cats by size. Dogs are bigger than cats. But when you get a little dog, I can no longer sort dogs by size anymore. And when our next door neighbors bought a dachshund, I had to figure out why this dachshund was not a cat. And I studied the dachshund, and I studied it, and I studied it, and I studied it. And I had to open a new file in my brain. And that file was, all dogs have the same nose shape. I could no longer use size to categorize dogs, so I had to use nose shape. It could be done by sound, barking, or meowing. It could be done by smell. Cats and dogs have, you know, different smell. It's sensory-based, putting things into categories. You know, some common categories that animals will often make is men are bad and ladies are good. Hate to say it, guys. Uh, maybe an, uh, an animal will be afraid of a guy with a beard. So they're afraid of all guys with beards. In fact, I heard about one elephant where they got a new keeper and he had a beard and the elephant about killed him and they got the guy to shave the beard off and everything was fine because beards on guys got put in the category of bad because that's what the animal was looking at right when some bad things happened. Now, Alex the parrot, um, Irene Pepperberg's famous parrot, he understands categories. Pick out the red objects, the blue objects, the round objects, wood or, or metal objects. That's categories. Now, there's been some interesting research that shows that the kind of thinking that we share with the animals is obscured by language. And this is the research of Dr. Bruce Miller with Alzheimer's patients. And he, had, he has an article published in the journal Neurology, a very respectable scientific journal. And this painting came from an Alzheimer's patient that had no previous interest in art. One of his patients was a tape deck installer. Another one was a stockbroker. But they got a particular type of Alzheimer's called frontal temporal lobe dementia that destroys the frontal cortex, destroys the language parts of the brain. And as the language parts of the brain were wrecked, there was a four or five year period where music talent and art talent emerged. In other words, it was unmasked. This, Painting looks a lot like um, autistic savant art. 
And when I was a little kid, loud noises really hurt my ears. A lot of animals have very sensitive hearing. Some research done up in Canada by Joe Stuckey found that yelling and screaming at animals is really stressful. They differentiate between a gate slamming that has no intent towards them and people yelling and whistling. The animal knows the difference. And the heart rate goes up more to the yelling and screaming than it does to gate slamming because the animal knows the gate sound probably wasn't directed at him. And animals have extremely you know, high frequency hearing. And some of these loud noises, they hurt my ear like a dentist drill. I get very concerned about uh, some of the animals in, in different places uh, being subjected to noise. It's, um, you know, some of the ventilating systems are really noisy. You know, what's that doing to, them, to the animals? Well, we don't know. Animals that have a flighty genetics that startle really easily are more sensitive to, guess what, rapid movement and high-pitched intermittent noise. You know, animals, just like people, have different, you know, sensitivities to things. Watch your ear radar on your grazing animals. On all your grazing animals, all the hoof stock, the ears work independently. See how the horse and the zebra have an ear on each other? And the other ear is on me taking the picture. Now, when they get scared or they get aggressive, the ears go flat back. Well, watch the ear radar. That can be an early warning. Fear is the main emotion in autism. Until I took antidepressant uh, medication, I was in a constant state of panic attacks all the time. It was absolutely, totally terrible. And the hoof stock are going to have much higher fear than the carnivores. And fear is the scientifically correct word. There's a tendency in the veterinary literature and the agriculture literature to avoid this little word fear. People tend to avoid it. And you go into the neuroscience literature and the biology literature, they use the fear word. And it's a scientifically correct word. Where I found, you know, I've had journal article reviewers um, say that I have to call it excitement or agitation. Well, I think some people don't want to admit that some of the stuff they're doing maybe is really frightening and scaring the animal. Fear circuits in the brain have been fully mapped, and they have been mapped for 20 years. Uh, a lot of that research is already is a, is, is a reviewed in animals in translation. You know, the brain stuff on this is known. This is not some idle speculation. You get into the whole thing about whether or not animals have emotion. Well, they've got the same neurotransmitters we've got. Psychiatric drugs like Prozac and Valium work on animals. If their emotions were from another planet, those drugs wouldn't work on them, but they do. You know, but I think their emotions may be simpler. You know, they, an animal can get aggressive one minute and then calm down much more quickly than a person sort of ruminates on it a whole lot more. Now, this is my stress graph. Cortisol is stress hormone. And up there at the top, you've got beef cattle handled very roughly with lots of electric prods. And we got 63 nanograms per milliliter of the stress hormone. It's really bad stuff. It lowers immune function. Um, we've, in some work that I did with beef cattle, we found that cattle that get all agitated and fearful and squeeze shoot gain less weight. Now here you've got deer where the big net came out of the sky and they just held them down. Highly stressful, 45 uh, nanograms per milliliter. Now we got beef cattle with quiet handling. We're still forcing them to do it, but we're doing it nicely. That gives you a two-thirds reduction in the stress. Dairy cows are even lower because they're trained. They voluntarily cooperate. And then you've got cattle baseline, and then here's what I'm really proud of. It's a research that I did with Nancy Earlbeck um, 10 years ago at the Denver Zoo. We trained antelopes to go into a box, and it took a long time to train them. We have an article in Zoo Biology to stand still and voluntarily cooperate with blood sampling without any sedatives out of the back leg. We trained them to go into a thing that looked like a shipping crate with remote control vertical doors. And it took 10 days to train them to tolerate the doors sliding up and down. You have to introduce each new thing very gradually. Because if you frighten that animal early in training, you can forget it. You'll never get them in that box. And in the beginning, we had to go through a long habituation process. And then once we got them habituated where they'd go in, then you can use standard operant conditioning on them. But you can't use operant conditioning in the beginning because you've got to get them trained not to be afraid of the doors going up and down. If I had just pulled the door open suddenly, they would have panicked. 
and their thinking's very specific. Because when some roofers came to roof their barn, they panicked. Well, that was, a, that was something totally new. You know, and then we got them used to the sound of the doors opening and shutting, and you could do it really quickly. And they're, all the directions are in a zoo, but we have two zoo biology articles, one on Nyella and one on Bongo. Everybody's doing this now, but 10 years ago, I was looked at like I was completely crazy. Like, there's no way that this is going to work. And we've even worked on now on training pronghorns, and that was supposed to be totally impossible. That has to be done even more slowly and more careful, and they are so specific. Like, if a Canada goose flies over the pen this way, they're fine. If it flies over that way, they panic. You know, their, their visual thinking is even more specific. Now, I like to divide stress up into three categories and how the brain handles stress. You know, you've got fear, you've got pain. And yes, animals do feel pain. Sometimes the fear stress is worse, though. But they do feel pain because animals will self-medicate. There's been work done in the rat and in the chicken. And if you artificially create arthritis in the joint, they will self-medicate on nasty-tasting op uh, opioid painkiller water that tastes really bitter and awful. And they'll drink that nasty water. And then as the leg heals, switch over to good, you know, regular, just regular fresh water. That's the gold standard. Self-medication experiment. It's been done in the rat and in the chicken. So obviously, of course, everything that's above that is going to feel pain. And then you have physical stresses, like all the cold that we've had out in Colorado. It's absolutely terrible. You know, sometimes with a lot of animals, you take a buddy along. A lot of animals don't want to be alone. Panic when they're alone. Cattle's one of those kind of animals. Now, if you have an animal that's used to living alone, take a buddy in there, it'd be a stress. But sometimes when animals are used to living together, take a buddy along, they're going to stay a lot calmer. It's very important that an animal's first experience with a new keeper, a new trailer, a new anything be a good first experience. Because if that first experience is really bad, like falling down and smashing their head, oh, we got somebody here doing email in the front row. Okay, maybe we ought to share that with everybody here. <laughs> no, I uh, like to embarrass people to have their blackberries, their crackberries out when I'm doing a talk. <laughs> what? Oh you're, taking, oh, you're taking notes on it? Oh, I'm sorry about that. Okay, if you're taking notes on it, okay, that's fine. If you're taking notes on it, that's absolutely fine, just as long as you're not doing an email on it. I had a student in my class that um, was text messaging on his phone in my class, and I asked him to share the message with the rest of the class, and he just shut that phone up and put it away in his pocket. <laughs> okay. But they, um, if that first experience is a really bad first experience, they get a fear memory. And there's been research by Joseph Ledoux, and he has a really good book out called The Emotional Brain. And what, they, what he's learned on mapping these fear circuits is you cannot erase a fear memory. There's no delete. So when you train the animal to, to get over the fear, you're training it, I'm going to use computer terminology because I don't have time to explain all the, all the neural circuits, but it works like this. You can train the animal to close the file, but you cannot delete it. And to keep the file closed, the frontal cortex has to keep sending down a signal to keep it closed. And in the more high-strung nervous animals, it's harder to keep the file closed. You know, you rough up an Arab horse, so it's not going to get over it very easily. Now, the thing that it's looking at right when it has the bad experience, it, you know, sometimes you get fear memories of odd things. Like dogs often will get afraid of the piece of pavement they were looking at when they got hit by a car, rather than getting afraid of cars. You expect them to get afraid of cars, but sometimes they get afraid of the thing they were looking at. And it could be something, you know, kind of crazy, you know, maybe a red bucket or something they were looking at, and then you're wondering, well, why are they afraid of that? Well, if you bang your cattle on the head, they're going to remember it, and they're not going to want to go back in there again. They remember that kind of stuff. Here's a horse that was afraid of black cowboy hats. White cowboy hat was fine. Black cowboy hat was scary. Ball caps were okay. Now, I'm just kicking myself. I didn't take my black purse. I had a black purse about half the size of that briefcase. 
Now, I'm going to bet you that black purse, especially a round purse, might cause some problems. Now, when the hat was put down on the ground, it was less scary than on somebody's head. There's no way you could have gotten that close to that horse with a black hat on your head. Now, the problem I've got with black hats is if I want to show this horse, I can't get rid of every black hat in the world. There's uh, going to be uh, some black hats around. Now, sometimes if the animal has a trusted person with them, they can help them keep the file closed and be okay. Somebody else goes to ride them, and then it's not okay. In the mind of an animal, a person on a horse and a person on the ground are two different categories. A big problem that I see with cattle is uh, cattle um, you know, raised on a ranch that works strictly on horses, then they go out to a feedlot, and they're trying to get them in and out of the veterinary chute with people on foot, and they can be really crazy because they've never been handled by people on foot. Another thing that can happen in horses is you can have a horse that maybe you can ride it, but you have all kinds of problems with groundwork, with shoeing and veterinary work. That's sometimes a common problem with BLM uh, horses, the um, Mustangs, because their bad experiences happen with people on the ground. You know, so you can ride them just fine. Then there's other horses where you can't ride them, but they're perfectly fine with the ground stuff. See, those are different file folders. Here are just some examples of specific fear memories. We've already discussed some of these. Um, animals are very good at recognizing the voice of the good and bad people. One of the things we learned with our antelopes is that the veterinarian who had originally darted them could never work with the trained animals. They knew his voice. They knew what he looked like. They knew his walk. You could bring in strange veterinarians and they could handle the animals. But the original person that was the bad dart gun man could never handle the trained animals. The fear memory was just too much. New experiences. The thing about new things is if, if an animal can voluntarily go up to it, new things are attractive. You know, you put new, new uh, enrichment stuff in, you know, the animal wants to go interact with that. But if you take something new and shove it in an animal's face suddenly, and that animal's in a confined area, it can be very scary. Novelty is both scary and attractive. It's scary when you get cornered with it. It's attractive if you walk up to it on your own. And here are some steers just walking up to a clipboard. And then the wind blew it and then they jumped back. I call that curiously afraid. It's sort of like two competing motivations. The attraction to novelty and then it moved and then you got fear. Well, there's a zebra down in Africa and he decided to come in from the game park and live with the uh, horses. And you see, he looks perfectly calm there. But this is an animal, if you got it cornered somewhere, you'd have explosive panic. But you don't see that temperament when he's in a place where he feels relaxed. Well, the thing is, uh, learning is a big factor. Novelty's in the eye of the beholder. To these bulls being amongst all these whirly gig things, that was just normal. And when I opened the car door, the bulls ran away. That wasn't something normal. You know, it's all a matter of how you're brought up. In fact, a common thing with animals that's been learned by uh, Fred Provenza about grazing, animals like mom's cooking. The mother animal teaches baby what to eat. And if you, let's say you have an animal you have to transfer somewhere else, if you can get uh, some of the food from the new place, if the food's going to be different, and, they, and the mother animal teaches the baby to eat that, you're going to have an easier time with it in the future. One of the big problems they have at, at cattle shows and at horse shows is people go, oh, my horse or, or my steer was fine at home. He went berserk, absolutely berserk at the show. And the problem is, is you got three big scary things at a show you don't have at home. Balloons, flags, and bikes. Why are they so bad? Rapid motion especially jerky, erratic, rapid motion, high contrast of light and dark, and bikes are scary because they sneak up onto you really, really, really silently, and, and that's real scary. Here are just some examples of extreme panic behavior. Flags. You know, when you get animals used to flags. Animals are used to flags, they're not going to be scared of flags. I had one ranch where they were ready to tear down their, their veterinary facility because the cattle wouldn't go in. You know what was wrong with it? The flagpole was right next to the veterinary chute, and the flag's up there flapping. You know, high contrast of light and dark, rapid movement, and a real scary noise. 
And then my assistant, Mark, had a little red dog that was afraid of hot air balloons. And her fear generalized in a very specific way. Okay, you have a hot air balloon against the sky. That's one scary picture. And she got afraid of them because one of them revved up a burner right over the house one time. Then she got afraid of those red plastic balls they put on power lines to keep planes from hitting um, power lines. Then the next thing she got afraid of was the rear end of a tanker truck going over the top of a hill. So I go, okay, round, big round stuff. That's what she's scared of. But then there were some round things she was not afraid of. Traffic lights, a globe lamp at the pizza parlor. And I finally figured out that her category was round against the sky. Traffic lights were round against a black rectangle. And the pizza parlor lights were round against a brick wall. Round against the sky was her category of really bad, scary things. I'm very concerned, especially with pets, that a lot of animals are not getting enough socialization. You know, when they're young, they need to get it as puppies. They also need to get it as older animals. We've got so many behavior problems in dogs. I mean, and I talked to somebody the other day that had a really rambunctious um, Labrador cross. That dog needed, you know, 15 minutes a day of good hard frisbee is what he needed. And he would have been fine. You know, but animals have to learn social interaction when they're young, and they have to be taught it by older, experienced animals. I'm sure all of you are aware of the horrible problem with the orphan male elephants put out onto the plains, and they were growing up and raping and killing rhinos, which is completely weird behavior. So they had to get some adult, properly socialized males to get in there and teach these teenagers, you know, if that's not the thing to do. When you're working with an animal, you've got to figure out its true motivation. And the big mistake that most people make is they mix up fear and aggression. Fear and aggression are two totally different emotions. Just think to yourself, you feel very different when you're fearful than when you're angry. And if you punish fear, you're just going to make the fear worse. You know, and then instinctual behavior, those are your hardwired behavior patterns, different animals have different behavior patterns, and then abnormal behaviors are things like stereotypies, you know, repetitive, um, repetitive behaviors, and I've just been reading a whole lot of research on that, and the mechanisms in the brain seem to change as to whether the stereotypy starts early, and you can block it with naltrexone, and the ones that are really established, I read about a polar bear they put on Prozac, been doing it for 22 years, and the Prozac made them stop, but then when they took him off, he started doing it again. We've got to work on preventing stereotypies. And that's what enrichment's all about. I mean, enrichment works. But you've got to use the right kind of enrichment. You know, I can remember um, years ago, there was an experiment of giving beach balls to sheep. Well, that just didn't work. They're grazing animals. They need forage. You know, you're working with a, with a, with a vicious dog at a vet clinic or whatever. Is it fear-based or is it true aggression? You know, should the owner be there? If it's fear, maybe you need the owner there to calm it down. But let's say you've got a drug dealer's uh, dog, and uh, that dog's going to feel he's going to have to protect that drug dealer against the vet, then you want him, you know, 100 miles down the road, not in the waiting room, because the dog will know he's there. But let's say the police bring in their, their guard dog, their trained dog. Now, should the policeman be there? It depends. If the dog has been trained, to let strangers handle you when, when you have the Kong toy and the owner says it's okay, then he should be there. If the dog hasn't been trained for that, then the policeman needs to be 10 miles down the road. So you've got to look at how is the animal perceiving that. One of the big problems you get in grazing animals is you have a bull that's been hand-reared, and when they get up to be sexually mature at age two, they think they're people, and you get into problems with them attacking people. You know, one of the ways to raise, you know, um, males that are going to be relatively safe is to rear them in a social group on the natural mother animal. Then they grow up, and they don't think they're people. It's not a tameness issue. It's a mistaken identity issue. You want the bull growing up knowing that he's a bull, and then when he gets to be two and wants to prove he's a big man and big dominant guy, he goes out after other cattle, not after people. Now... Dog society, we want to be the leader of the pack. 
See, one of the things you've got about dogs is they're just so social. Cattle, we do not want to be in their hierarchy. We, need, we want to be something, you know, sort of the benevolent uh, greater power or something to cattle. And they have their own social behavior they do to each other. One principle, handle your dominant animal first. Because if you handle a subordinate first and the dominant smells that on you, that may tend to make the dominant attack. Also, you've got to figure out what are the natural, you know, behavior patterns. I want to make it very clear, you know, like with the dogs and things like that, becoming dominant is not beating animals up. I want to make that very, very clear. The thing about a super social animal like a dog is you can dominate it strictly socially. You know, it has to sit before you feed it. Now, the thing is, different animals have different personality. In fact, Dr. Nick Dogman up at Tufts is coming out with a new book, on, and he talks about, you know, a, a dominant kind of a dog, maybe something like a Rottweiler, you've got to make it work for everything. There's no free lunch. You sit before you go outside. You sit before I pet you. You sit before uh, I feed you. But you have some little shy dog, you'd get it too scared if you did that. You see, this is where the personality of the animal, and probably not supposed to use words like personality, but let's put it this way, assertiveness or fearfulness. Let's use a little more objective terminology. Um, you want a, uh, the assertive animal, you've got to make it work, get stuff at once. A shy animal, you don't do that. Well, the thing about the grazing animals is you become what you were raised by. And these lambs, when they grow up, will try to breed goats because they think they're goats. Well, here's an example of pure, hardwired instinctual behavior. The mating dances of birds. Okay, she, he fluffs up his butt and she twirls around and it kind of goes like little um, computer programs. No thinking here, pretty brainless. And... Now, here's sort of an instinct little trick you can do with a horse. It's very, very brainless. And if you scratch a mare that's got a colt um, well, right around the udder area, she'll groom the colt. She'll also groom a gate. That shows you that that is hardwired behavior. It's totally brainless. It's like a robot. But that doesn't mean that animals are robots. Because when they're not doing this sort of stuff, they are thinking. Well, here's an example of totally learned behavior in a bull. This bull is a, fen a master fence wrecker. He took out seven barbed wire fences in one afternoon, and there's no cuts on them. He knew exactly how to push them over. That was learning. Do animals have true thinking or, you know, true cognition? I like the way Marion Stamp Dawkins defines cognition. It's solving a problem under new conditions. I just love this definition of thinking. This is what it's not. Then she goes on to define what it's not. It's not a rule of thumb. Okay, that's going to be operant or classical conditioning. Simple associative learning. It's also not these hardwired uh, fixed action patterns. Instinct's the old word. Fixed action pattern is the scientific word. And then the stimulus that turns it on is the sign stimuli. I kind of like computer terminology because I somehow think it's easier to understand, and that seems to be sort of how it works. Now, there's been some very interesting experiments with birds that show, yes, these crows really can think. You give a crow a bent paper clip that he can stick down this tube and snag the bucket of food, he will um, figure out how to use the bent paper clip. And then after he's learned that, you then give him straight ones. And they'll stick the straight ones in there and go, oh. Then one day the female crow, crow stuck it in a crack and bent it. She made her own tool. And then her boyfriend went and stole all the food. So, <laughs> And even crows that are raised in a lab that have had no experience with things outside figure out how to do this. Blue jays uh, know when another jay is watching them hide their worm traits. And they wait until the other jay's not looking, and then they change the compartment that they're hiding their worm treat in. They know when the other jay is watching is going to rip off their worms. What is consciousness? You know, I think the orienting response is the beginning of thinking and consciousness. Okay, 
A deer hears a sound in the forest, he goes and he looks like that. Now, we're not just getting a reflex there. He can decide, do I flee, keep grazing, or keep watching? Okay, there's three different decisions he can make there. That's the beginning of flexible making decisions. It's not just, you know, a bull smells a cow in estrus, so he does the flame in response, you know, lift up his lip. That's robotic. But in this orienting response, they've, the deer has to make a decision. And I think it comes up as pictures, because I had a very uh, weird experience where I avoided hitting an elk on Interstate 25. And I had maybe four seconds to act. And an elk came by. I was on the southbound lane. An elk crosses the northbound part of the freeway. And I get this picture of a car rear-ending me. That's what would happen if I'd stomped on the brakes. Then the next picture was uh, an elk coming through the windshield. That would be swerving. And the third thing was slowing down and letting it go by. And I clicked on slowing down. He went by about 50 feet in front of me. You know, this was 11 o'clock in the morning, bright sunny day. Uh, elk, you know, second day of hunting season, and I think he'd been scared by a hunter. Now, here's a sheep that very, very well could figure out uh, which way, went, you know, which side they were going to get shocked. There was a dreadful device um, they use for, they call a humane method of restraint, and it's not. It's an electronic immobilizer thing, and it immobilizes the animal. It's absolutely dreadful, and we gave it, wanted to prove it was bad, so we gave the sheep a choice. Get put on a tilt table or get this shocker thing, and the sheep will pick the tilt table. But a number of sheep would come up to the decision point, and they'd look back and forth like, oh, oh, oh which way am I going to go? And they'd wiggle their head back and forth. I can see the decision-making process in my mind. I think with a part of the brain that would be Freud's subconscious. Yep, and sometimes it's obnoxious web pages that come up, uh, little pop-up ads. I'm not going to talk about them. And I didn't know that in most verbal people, they don't see that stuff. You know, and there seem to be different degrees of how well the visual thinking or sensory-based mind is suppressed. There's been some very interesting research on post-traumatic stress syndrome. People that remember the bad experience as pictures are more likely to have post-traumatic stress syndrome than people that remember it just in words. Now, another thing I've noticed is you have an animal with a really, you know, excitable temperament, and you force it to do something. They can really panic and not get over it. You have an animal with a calm temperament, and you force it to do something, it will sometimes habituate and get over it, provided it's not painful. Now, I don't want to be forcing it, you know, doing rough stuff on animals. But there is a genetic interaction here, where the animal that's got the higher fear, higher startle response, is the animal that if you do do something nasty to it, it has a much harder time getting over it. I'm very concerned with stuff going on with genetics, pet animals, and farm animals. You know, over-selecting an animal for single trait, you're going to end up wrecking your animal. Lameness in pigs and dairy cows is really bad. When the industry went towards the lean, lean, super lean pigs, they got a more excitable pig, and they got a pig that bit more tails and, and had more vices. And then look at pet animals, bulldogs that can't have their young without a cesarean because they keep getting the head big. And you get a situation, what I call bad becoming normal. They kept breeding for bigger and bigger and bigger heads. And, and, they, and they didn't realize, they only kind of realize what they're doing because it happens slowly. When I first started out in dairy, you had maybe 5% lame cows. Now you've got 25% lame cows. Over a period of 30 years, it slowly got worse. Bad becoming normal, and people don't realize it. Let's look at the white laying hen. Very skinny bred to give tons and tons of eggs. Well, look at the frazzled wreck she turns into. They beat the feathers off. You know, the battery cages uh, contribute to feather wear, but you can take a brown chicken, and they don't beat the feathers off. And, they, and these chickens have very soft feathers. And I look at this, and I go, yuck. This is just a genetic nightmare. And the thing is, is this happened gradually, and they didn't realize it. Well, people think of, you know, this horse with the blue eyes is really pretty. You know, you breed too much of this, you know, real pale albino kind of, starting to get some of the albino trait together. Some of the Dalmatians getting, you know, deaf puppies. I think that's just disgusting, having deaf puppies. 
and you'll have, you have a do dog that's deaf and it's genetic, uh, it should not be used for breeding. It's just that simple. This horse also had Tourette's syndrome. It, had, it, had, it, it would flinch every 60 seconds, just like Tourette's. Well, stuff like that's really pretty, but you can get into really nasty things like a lethal white. And what happened to those pig's ears? The other lean meanies bit them off and ate them. Now, if, now, let's talk about how things interact with the environment. Okay, these pigs were raised like just in concrete pens. Now, if the pigs had all been raised outside, this wouldn't have happened. But the animal that's got the flighty genetics has a, lot more, a much more difficult time tolerating a barren environment than the animal that's got uh, calm genetics. In fact, the laboratory animals and mice, for example, there's tremendous differences between different strains and breeds of mice on the amount of stereotypies. But there's also huge individual differences. You can have situations where maybe, you know, 25% don't do the stereotypies, even when they're all the same kind of genetics. You over-select for a single trait, you're going to wreck your animal, and it's just that simple, and I don't care what the trait is. You know, I've done a lot of work on temperament selection in cattle. And what I suggest to ranchers is, let's get rid of the real crazies. But you don't want to just select for absolute calmness because you're going to lose mothering ability and foraging ability if you do that. Well, there's a, a fox over in Russia, Belyev's fox, and they wanted to breed a tamer fox for the fur trade. Look at how slender it is, fine-boned. We also found that fine-boned animals, more flighty, very fine bone. So they bred for, for calmness, for gentleness. they are foxes that would act like dogs. Well, then they started to look like border collies. And all they did here was select for the temperament. Look, they changed. See how much thicker the body is, heavier bones? Just look at him, more slender, more lanky bones. This is out of a paper they did back in 1979. Well, and there are... Uh, my books on animals in translation. And what I think we want to do now is um, I just want to get some good discussion going before they tell me that, you know, they, they, we are supposed to go out and sign the books and end the discussion. I don't know how long I'm supposed to go with the webcast. Uh, okay. And if nobody has a question, I'm going to pick somebody. <laughs> so somebody better get the hand up. Okay, right there. Oh, you're going to have to talk, get, take this get mic here, and you've got to talk right. Well, maybe we can hand her the mic. And, and then you've got to hold it really close so that the uh, webcast can hear it. I have um, two terriers. One is very calm. They're both mixed breeds, and um, one of them is a little bit more nervous. And the nervous one is absolutely driven crazy by a um, buzzer and a phone going off to show it has a, a mobile phone to show it, it needs um, more battery or something like that. And she will actually run away. If she gets out, she'll just run a block away. I think that mobile phone is hurting the dog's ears. You know, so you've got to get into whether it's a learned thing. But, I'm, but I think there's some sound sensitivity issues. And the worst sounds, like for, like for people with autism, are those high-pitched intermittent sounds, like smoke alarm type of sounds. I would recommend getting a different ringtone. Um, I've got this ringtone. I call it my grandmother's hall phone. And I can't hear it when it's in the briefcase. I think I'm going to have to get rid of that ringtone. But I think if, um, it's, a, it's a ringtone that Singular has. It sounds like an old dial phone. Something like that would probably be less bad. I would experiment with a lower frequency, less high-pitched ringtone because I, that may actually be hurting the dog's ears and, and it's easy to change that. And it's going to bother the high-strung one probably more. I have a dog question too. You're really helpful and I have a dog who's very neurotic when it comes to going on walks. Sometimes she'll just trot right outside and everything's fine. And other times we get outside and she just looks at me like I've kicked her and she won't come with me at all. And I can't figure out, there's not really a difference in the atmosphere. It's always the same block, leaving the house. She'll just stop outside the gate and she won't move. And I can't ever tell when it's going to be good and when it's going to be bad. First of all, I want to ask you, is this a dog that you raised from a puppy? 
She was six and a half months when we got her. Okay, well, that's enough time where somebody else could have done something bad. Yeah. And you probably have got some kind of a fear memory coming back, and you're just not picking up what it is that she's picking up on. Do you change, wear different clothes when you take them out for walks? Or? I mean, yeah, depending on the weather, but it's not, it doesn't seem to be me. It seems to be something outside, but I can't figure out what it is. And it's often when my husband tries to take her out by himself. Sometimes okay, well, now him. you're telling, all right, now you're giving me more information. <laughs> and one time I had a great uh, talk with Patricia McConnell about dog behavior problems, and she said, she says, I asked the clients to tell me what the dog did so that I can, so it's like a videotape. Okay, now you see, see the beginning, you see the, there's always other information. Okay, now I think there's something with being afraid of a man here possibly involved in this. Yeah, that could be. I mean, she's better if we both go together, but sometimes she'll go with him fine, and other times if he tries to take her out in the morning, he can't go anywhere. Well, there's something that is different. Now, sometimes you can, you know, if you just act really confident and things like that, that helps the dog to be more confident. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, I'll just keep trying. <laughs> Maybe it's something just flapping that I'm not seeing. So well, maybe there's got to be something because if she's perfectly okay sometimes yeah. and, and terrified other times, there's something changed that's bringing a fear memory back. And if you can figure out what that is and get rid of it, that's just great. Now, if you can't, you know, then you get into the controversy. I know there's been a lot of controversy about the Caesar show on flooding. It's forcing animals into things they're afraid of. And uh, with high-strung animals, I think it's a very bad thing to do. Uh, low strung, you know, really calm animals. I'm not, I don't, I'm not saying I think it's the greatest thing to do, but it, it um, you know, they may habituate and get over it where the high strung animal is not. What kind of dog is it? She's a mixed breed, small chihuahua, spaniel mix, maybe. Pretty nervous? <laughs> not, is she high really. energy? She's not really high strung, no. Oh, she's not. She's very passive, but. But there's something there, you know, that she's afraid of. And maybe what you just try to do, this is one thing that Caesar does I kind of like, is this whole idea of being calm and confident. Another thing you do is, is don't reward submissive behavior. You know, like if she, when she acts confident, pet her and, and, and stroke her. Don't pat her, stroke her. Animals don't like patting that much. Stroke, you know, like the mother's tongue. And, and stroke her when she acts calm. See, one, see, if you go up there and you stroke her when she's all scared, you're reinforcing. So here you're going to try to get rid of some of this by learning. You know, like if you want to get a dog not to jump on you, one thing you can do is you stroke it and you give, pay attention to it when it's not jumping on you. Right, see, right. That's, that's some simple operant conditioning, and that's a very positive way to deal with it. Okay, thank you. Well, I'm sorry to do this to you. We're standing here surrounded with hundreds of exotic animals, and I'm going to ask another dog question. Okay. Uh, I'm about to adopt a dog, I think, from Animal Rescue Group, and I've met this dog once, and it was a two-year-old, I think, Rottweiler Labrador mix. Now, my concern is, even though I'm told this is a really sweet dog, this is a two-year-old dog. If I'm preparing for this new animal to change from her foster home and come into my house, I'm clueless. <laughs> do you have, first of all, do you have another dog now? I have no, haven't had an animal in the house for years. I've and just has this dog come, been in a single, you know, so you got to go, you know, some dogs, there's problems with inner dog aggression. Okay, we're not going to have that. You know, is she, is she living with other dogs now? or is she... I'm not sure. I'm not sure. They say, you know, she's no problem, she's happy, but nobody's adopted her yet. So. Well, people hear Rottweiler and they instantly yeah. get worried about it. You know, the thing is, crossing that with a lab, you don't know how the genetics goes. I mean, it could go more the Rottweiler, you know, assertiveness. And, and the thing with the Rottweiler is you've got to be, this is where Caesar really does a good job, where he acts like the confident leader. You make the dog heal, you make it walk behind you. And you can do that without doing any, anything rough or nasty with it. Um, you know, and there's some stuff that Caesar does I hate, and there's, but the way he does the calm, confident thing, some of these more, you know, Rottweiler type of dogs, he, he does a really good job with them. And he's not hitting them or doing it nasty. It's, there's a hardwired behavior of 
you know, get it to go behind you. Um, but then if it has a lab personality, it's going to want to just get you to throw the frisbee for it, and it may be real high energy, and it's going to need a lot of fun, hard play. See, this is where different, see, people think one size always fits all. You know, like the frisky lab just needs lots of hard play. The Rottweiler is going to need, you have to keep, they're very assertive, not all of them. See, again, there's a lot of variation within a breed. But an assertive one, you have to make it heal and, 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 and you make it do your bidding before you do stuff for it. If you have something a little shy dog, you don't want to do that. And it's hard to say exactly what, what kind of personality this dog's going to have. You know, it might be a good idea it's close by to go over and interact with it some before you bring it to your house. Fortunately, you don't have the problem of it dealing with another dog. Right. My, my concern was just that two, by two years old, it may have had the opportunity to have had bad experiences that I wasn't going to know about. Well, you just don't know. You know, I mean, there's a lot of two-year-old dogs that are adopted, and they're just fine. It's, it's okay. We've got somebody here in the red sweater over here. That Could you tell us a little bit about how you used your instincts that came to you through autism to help promote and change the animal welfare in the farm industry, please? Well, when I first started out um, working on handling cattle, people were in the 70s were incredibly rough with beef cattle, and the beef cattle didn't want to go through the veterinary chute. And I was one of the first people to get down in the chute and see what they're seeing. I said, well, this animal's scared of this chain hanging down, this shadow. The sun's in their eyes, or it's too dark. And, and nobody looked at that before. And people thought I was absolutely out of my mind and crazy that I would get in the veterinary chute to see what cattle were seeing. Because one of the things I found, if you just take these things that are afraid of out of the chute, you know, like I've, I've done a lot of work with the meat plants on uh, auditing meat plants for animal welfare. And they've got to be able to move... Uh, a uh, hundred animals and only have no more than three mooing and bellering, you know, due to prodding and stuff like that. And, and in order for the plants to pass the audit, they had to find these things the animals were afraid of, like a reflection on a floor and maybe move a light three feet, a ceiling light three feet to get rid of the reflection, add a light on, on part of the chute that was dark, uh, tie up a chain that's flapping, put up uh, some conveyor building to, so the, the cattle didn't see uh, people up ahead. And you might need to have, you might have four of these, I call them the distractions, you might have four of these things, and you've got to track down all four of them and find them and get rid of them. And then the animals will move up the chute easily. Can you hear? Yeah. I have a question about the cloning debate. Um, we're talking about cloning livestock cattle um, to maximize, you know, the perfect cow, I guess. And it seems like a lot of the debate is about whether the food we get from this kind of process is safe to eat. Um, but it seems to me that there's another question about just the sort of integrity of the gene pool. And I wanted to ask what you... I mean, if you're using fewer and fewer of the same genes over and over again, and you're artificially inseminating with, um, you know, one bull is inseminating thousands of cows. Well, that's already happening with dairy cattle. Right. It's been happening the, for years. I realize the bull yeah. part is happening, but if, then if you start cloning the, fem the females, um, is, this, is this wise? Well, I'm worried about monoculture, and, you know, which is basically... Um, getting all the genetics too much the same. We've already made some of these mistakes already with chickens and pigs using conventional breeding. We've made a real mess out of some animals just with old-fashioned conventional um, breeding. But uh, I get worried about over-selecting too much just for the production traits because you're going to lose disease resistance. In fact, with the lean pigs, when the lean pigs came in about 15 years ago, uh, uh, the pork industry got smacked with a disease called PERS, porcine respiratory and reproductive syndrome. It always was there before, but it never caused a big problem. Now they had all these pigs coming down with this. <coughs> and the USDA did a study and found there was a genetic component to susceptibility to this PERS. And that sort of stuff I'm really concerned about because, you know, bananas are clones. <coughs> bananas have been clones for years using a really old-fashioned techniques with cuttings. 
you know, it's no biotech stuff, and there's a disease that's um, wiping out the regular yellow banana. You know, the Irish potato famine, just using regular breeding, um, you know, it was a monoculture, and a disease came in there and wiped out the potatoes. And, and I think, uh, you know, we've, we've got into those messes just with, you know, regular genetics, and I'm concerned about that. Now, cattle still got to live outside. I mean, you know, beef cattle, when it comes to animal welfare, I think beef cattle, for the most part, are the best at welfare because the cows and calves are living out on the range. You know, right now, we've had 60 inches of snow in Colorado, and we've lost 15,000 head of range cattle. So um, this year, the welfare hasn't been so hot. But um, they're living outside, and you can't get into these more extreme genetic things because they, those animals can't survive outside. You know, the modern broiler chicken, uh, you know, that gets fat, you know, so, so heavy. Now, of course, there is a feed interaction. If you don't feed it as much, it doesn't get as heavy. But it, uh, those highly selected animals that have a hard time living on the range. So there's going to be less problems with beef than with, with dairy. We've got into horrible lameness uh, problems with dairy. Uh, there's some genetic components there. There's also a lot of other other issues there too. It isn't just genetics. And, you know, we get into you know the problems with chicken leg problems, very bad leg deformities in chickens, which the industry is now starting to correct. That was done the old-fashioned way. Hens and roosters put together. They don't even AI chickens. They're they they still breed natural, but they got into some weird problems like killer roosters that would chop up the hens and. Um, you know, they were breeding for big breasts, and they also bred for a very aggressive rooster. And, and you know, nobody, nobody wanted to deliberately breed in a you know, super aggressive rooster. You know, you can sometimes get sort of a curveball thrown at you where there's another trait linked. I mean, Belief never dreamed that when he selected for a tamer fur fox, he'd end up with a black and white border collie fox, that that hair coat um, that color would be linked to it. Yeah, right there with the blue shirt on. Hi, thank you. With your background, have you had um, very much, uh, have you done very much research with aust autistic children and their communicating with animals? Okay, the uh, therapeutic riding programs are often very, very um, helpful um, because you have three good things with there. You have the relationship with the horse, but then you also have rhythmic motion and it's a balancing activity. And therapists have found that when you do rhythmic activities, these are the nonverbal kids, and you do a balancing activity, and writing is both. Oftentimes, speech come in. And I've had parents say to me, their kids started talking for the first time on the horse. Um, and you're getting that such a good combination of rhythm and balance, and then it's really a fun activity where doing something in a, in a gym isn't anywhere near as much fun. Uh, and as far as sort of the relationship with the animal, some autistic kids are really good. And the animal, they really click with the animal, and others don't. You know, there's a tremendous amount of variability in, in autism. You know, and I get asked, well, should I get a service dog for my kid? Well, you've got to look at how is this child going to, you know, react to the dog. It might be a good thing. It might be a bad thing. I would say, on the whole, that the therapeutic riding programs for the people that are nonverbal, on the whole, tend to be really beneficial. You know, getting a dog for the child, that's going to be much, much more variable, and I'd recommend getting the kind of heavy set kind of lab that's not real frisky, you know, the kind that they use for guide dogs and for service dogs, very placid lab that's content to lay around uh, because they can, they, they're content to lay around. I mean, it's amazing the differences in labs. I can remember when I was a child, there were two labs. There was Tucky. She was one of these slender labs. Remember Tucky? Yeah, Ann. You remember Tucky? She was your favorite dog. And, you know, we didn't have any leash laws, so the dogs ran around. Can you imagine how miserable Tucky would have been? This is a ball crazy lab. If she had been locked up in the Kelsey's house, you know, if she was owned by an older couple. And if Tucky couldn't have been, you know, getting all the neighborhood to hit kids to throw a tennis ball for her, she would have been crazy. But then you remember Hunter? Hunter would come around very quietly, wag his tail, and he had no interest in the ball whatsoever. He was just a totally different personality. And the body shape of those two labs, Hunter looked like a service lab, really stocky and heavy, and Tucky was one of these real slender, long, slender leg kind of labs. And they were both black. You 
talked about in your book and mentioned today that you've had a lot of success looking at situations where animals were afraid to enter an area and finding things that people didn't know. They see simple things like the contrast of light and dark or a flag or whatever. And one of the challenges in, in um, conserving elephants in the wild is keeping them out we're of We're doing what in the environment? Conserving elephants in the wild okay. is keeping them out of places, out of people's farms, for instance. Have you ever thought about looking at ways that that might happen, these simple ways that you talked about? It's like looking well, at the it. thing with the, the things that scare the animals in the shoots, like it's too dark or there's something shiny in there or some reflection, um, you know, when you're handling an animal, you don't have all day to let it look at that stuff. Now, if the animal comes up there and spends an hour looking at that, you know, drain or whatever, the, you know, the reflection or whatever, it's going to walk, you know, through it. You know, so, you know, the elephant's going to have time to come up and go, oh, well, spend an hour deciding whether he's going to go in and through this fence and, like, eat up these crops. Uh, it's, uh, you put something out there that, some shiny thing or something like that, it works for a little bit. You know, it's like those fake owls. I mean, our airport, DIA, DIA had a fake owl on every jet bridge at the airport at one time. And the pigeons still roost in the jet bridges. They still poo on the cars in the parking garage and the are expensive parking places and you get your car pooed on. I'd, and when the pigeons, uh, uh, in the daytime, the heads are facing out and at night their butts face out from this big concrete beam. And... You know, in the beginning, that fake owl works, but then they, they very quickly learn that it's nothing and they can just roost, roost on the jet bridge right next to the fake owl. Now, that they're all gone now, DIA, they got rid of all the fake owls. But, you know, they went through that trying to, trying to get rid of the birds. You know, and then there's a thing where they paint a spiral on the center of the jet engine. I, I hope that works. I don't want to be on a plane that eats up a can of goose. I really don't. That would be uh, very, very bad. You know, but animals are, you know, elephants are incredibly smart, too. Okay, right there. Well, the thing is, is that animals get used to visitors uh, out on the other side of the glass. And like when the um, antelopes at the Denver Zoo panicked at the people on the roof, you know, they were used to the visitors around the enclosure, but people on the roof, you see, that was something new. And one of them smacked up, you know, on the fence and got, almost got very seriously hurt. Um, you know, then you get, um, I've seen, I saw gorillas putting on a show for uh, visitors beautiful exhibit in New York um, at, the, uh, at the zoo in New York and they take you into this auditorium and they give you this beautiful uh, video and everything about the gorillas and then this curtain opens up. It's very, very dramatic and you look out onto the, onto the gorilla exhibit. It's absolutely gorgeous. And then you walk out there and there's this one teenage gorilla. He, wa he wasn't there when the curtain opened up because he would have ruined it if he'd been there. And this teenage gorilla would... Um, look right at some visitor, and he'd bow down like this. Then he'd suck some food out of, a, out of a little tube, and then he'd look right at the visitor and bow down again. Then he'd barf it up in his hand and bow down, and then he'd lick the, where he'd spit it out in his hand, and everyone's like going, ooh, 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 and, and a new visitor would come along, and he'd do that again. Now, he was obviously, you know, getting a rise out, you know, getting a reaction out of the visitors that he liked. That wasn't quite what, now fortunately I didn't see that when they were, we were in the theater because that would have just ruined it if he'd been there. He was around on the side and you couldn't see him from where the curtain was. But that, um, he certainly wasn't, you know, afraid of the visitors. You know, and, I, and but something ha happens like a hot air balloon comes over or a, uh, somebody on the roof, you see, that's something truly novel.
Well, he's 16 years old. I mean, the first thing I have to ask is, you know, how's he doing in school? What's his favorite subject? Because I think it's really important to develop the strength. I went into a career, I didn't go into a math career or, or foreign language into something I'd be bad at. I went into a career where I could use my visual thinking skill to, um, uh, you know, in my career. So the first thing we need to be thinking about, and I have a little book called Developing Talents. I'll put this computer back on that right there, Developing Talents. And it's about um, careers. And at 16 years old, we need to be thinking about what can he do? What is he good at? It's the first thing I want to ask. And he's doing a grade level and everything in school. Yeah, you see, now I had, you know, one of the things that really helped me when I was in, in high school, and kids were teasing me, and it was just absolutely terrible, was Mr. Carlock, my science teacher. Because I couldn't do algebra and language, but other subjects I was goofing around and goofing off. And Mr. Carlock gave me a reason to study. It was now a reason to study because the goal was to become a scientist. So now there was a goal. So developing of the area of strength and mentoring, those are two very important things on career development. Now, of course, you know, become a police officer, uh, you need to have some people skills there. And is that an appropriate job for him? Now, maybe something like forensics where you look at the evidence where it's more of the you know, you try to figure out the evidence. That would be, you know, you don't have a social aspect to it. You know, I, I strongly recommend that he's in college and he needs to be doing some interning things, like working in a forensics lab. Um, so he's, he's getting exposed to work stuff. He needs to start learning work skills. You've got to be on time. You know, I'm seeing kids fired from jobs because they just aren't showing up or just rudeness stuff, you know, like making comments, really nasty comments about what people look like or something like that. I mean, I was taught when I was five years old not to do that. And I did a book with Sean Barron on called The Unwritten Social Rules. And I know a lot of Asperger types that are my age, 40s, 50s, and 60s, employed in technical jobs. See, one of the problems we have in the high schools, most educators don't know anything about the whole world of technical things out there engineering things, interesting technical stuff. And, and, uh, and kids, when they're young, are not getting some of these basic social rules pounded in, like saying please, you know, thank you, uh, not pushing in line, you know, politeness things. You know, those were pounded into kids in the 50s. And I think some of the mild Asperger kids today got more problems today because uh, my parents wouldn't let me misbehave in church. And you've got to differentiate between a sensory problem, okay, like your dog have the problem with the dog with the cell phone. I think that's sensory. Okay, if the, if the kid has a meltdown in Walmart, that's because he feels like he's inside the speaker at the rock and roll concert. You know, we had fancy Sunday dinners at Granny's, and I was expected to sit through at least 20 minutes of that, and there was no sensory problem there. Now, if our church had had an electronic uh, thing like they've got now, I wouldn't have been able to tolerate that. You know, they had the old-fashioned organ. I actually kind of liked the organ. But I was expected to sit through church, and I had to behave. You know, found a, having a temper tantrum in church, uh, that was going to be some big trouble. You know, there were some expectations for, for, um, for behavior. But you have to make sure you're not forcing them into a sensory overload situation. We have a question in the back. Okay. What are your thoughts on the uh, future of children diagnosed with autism today? Well, the, th the thing about autism is it's such a broad spectrum. You're going all the way from somebody that's going to be very handicapped and have to be living in a supervised living situation for the rest of their life up to Einstein. Einstein today would be diagnosed autistic because he had no language until age three. Then you have the milder Asperger's where there's no obvious speech delay. Well, I'm going to guess that if you didn't have the Asperger traits, you wouldn't have electricity in this building today. Tesla, who invented the uh, power plant, would be labeled autistic today. Many good engineers and, and computer people have Asperger traits. You wouldn't have these cell phones and all these little technical toys and, and uh, airplanes and everything else 
if you didn't have people that were more interested in things than in, than in being social. It's like a little bit of the autism genetics. You get a brilliant scientist or musician or mathematician. You get too much of it, you get somebody that's handicapped. And I get very, you know, I always get asked, well, is autism increased? Asperger's has always been here. They've always been here. I see undiagnosed Asperger's all over the place in my work, all over the place. You know, the meat plants wouldn't run without these people. It's just that simple. <laughs> and neither would any other factory, for that matter. And now where I think there may be an increase is the, some of this uh, more severe low-functioning where the child appears to be normal and then loses language at age two. That's where there may be a real increase. The Asperger's is now you're putting a medical diagnosis on basically a nerd. And I get, and I get, I get, I mean, I get concerned that some of these really smart kids may be held back by this. Um, yes, it, it, it's, uh, you know, I saw a mother one time bring a kid up to the book table and he had 150 IQ and they were going to put him on welfare because he wasn't social. And I said, look, they used to diagnose those as gifted. You know, I mean, it, it's, you know, there's not everybody is super social. You've got to learn, learn basic social, you know, niceties. But that doesn't mean you're going to be super social. And a lot of the more Asperger type of kids, they're going to get social interaction through shared interests. You know, chess club, computer club, art club, drama club, band, uh, you know, get involved in these things where there's a shared interest. You know, and because, you know, if you're somebody, you know, I, I talked to this one lady, she's, uh, her idea of a really great candlelit, mo uh, really romantic dinner, you know, the finest wine, the finest restaurant, it sets the stage for a three-hour discussion on computer data storage systems. <laughs> because that is just the most interesting thing that there is. In fact, um, Nancy Minshew, one of the really top autism researchers, did a um, brain scan on me to look at my visual thinking circuits. And in all brains, you've got a big internet line that runs from the visual cortex up to the frontal cortex, a big trunk line. Mine was twice as big. And they found that same thing in, in some of the other, other uh, people. Also, they did another thing to see whether you were interested in things or interested in people. And they showed all these old weird videos from the 70s of people and cars and food and all kinds of things. And my brain got activated by the things. And one of the reasons it did is I was trying to figure out where they get these really goofy, goofy old videos from. <laughs> and, and looking at the objects gave me more information on maybe where did these weird tapes, you know, come from. I was trying to, like, figure out where they got the weird tapes. Other people were, you know, and the, and the people of pictures were just sort of, they were video, but they were kind of still video, like uh, snapshots of people just standing, you know, getting uh, their pictures taken. And, and the objects, I mean, there's all kinds of stuff, you know, wharfs and uh, bridges and apples and all kinds of, you know, things like that. And stuff out of a Pink Floyd video, and I'm going, you know. <laughs> you know, so I was attending to that. But the thing is, if you didn't have people that were interested in things, we wouldn't have any computers, we wouldn't have any electricity. You know, think about it. Back in the caveman days, the really social people did not make the first stone spear. <laughs> okay, there's somebody who's got their hand up right there. I I have a question about the use of antidepressants. I, I, you have a little bit of a hard time hearing it. The use of antidepressants uh, with aggressive animals. Well, I, you know, the, you get into the controversies about using medication, you know, just like you can in people. And sometimes there's a tendency, I think there's way too many um, stimulants and things handed out to ADHD kids like candy. I mean, they need to get out and get some more exercise. I mean, my mother used to say to me, run the energy out of you when I was little. And, and I think there's some situations, uh, usually you wouldn't be using an, where using a medication on an animal would be appropriate, but it's not the only thing you do. You see, you get into the thing where, you know, you go to one person, they want to throw drugs at everything. Somebody else is a pure behavior person and doesn't believe in biology. Now, I had these panic attacks that had to be controlled medication. 
You know, I think there's some situations where a dog's really messed up and the OCD behavior really, really bad, and he's so messed up, you're probably going to have to put him on some Prozac to get it stopped. You know, I want to emphasize, let's prevent these problems. You know, you have good environmental enrichment, you don't have these problems. But then there's horrendous genetic problems. I talked to a lady on the phone the other day. That she worked for an animal shelter, and she had a really nice, sweet pit bull, a really nice female dog. It got bred to some drug dealer dog that had a real extreme head, and they adopted out nine puppies at, you know, a very, very young age. They couldn't possibly be messed up, and all nine of them, by the time the dogs became adults, came back for biting. Nine different families. Now, that's got to be a genetic component there. You, now, you get into that doesn't, you see, now you look at the whole pit bull thing, you could take any breed and wreck it. Nick Dodman's been talking now about problems with nasty goldens that are biting really bad. Um, you know, as you look at the history of breeds, and it changed, you know, the German, you know, the Dobermans have been, you know, really, you know, tamed down. Uh, but something's really, so those dogs have got a screw loose there, big, big, big time. And we shouldn't be breeding animals that have those kind of problems. You know, so instead of saying, well, get rid of all the pit bulls, a better thing to say is we shouldn't be, we need to figure out some really reliable tests for those really dangerous dogs. And I saw a video at a dog training conference where eight-week-old puppies were fighting constantly and didn't do any play. You know, maybe there's something like that that you do. Uh, but there's, a, you know, you could take the, you know, Rottweilers and wreck them or, you know, some other breed. But that's genetic and... Uh, You've got people out there deliberately breeding dogs for dangerous traits. You're going to have um, have real problems, and unfortunately, they all had to be put down. I think we have time for one more question, and Dr. Grand will be available for a book signing afterwards. So, hello, I have a cat. <clears throat> excuse me, who's 16 years old. Always been very placid, calm, um, and it, about two years ago, when he gets in a, at night, when he gets in a certain part of our hallway, he starts howling like a banshee. I mean, he's never he, done that before. No, no, and you know, usually it's when we turn when I turn the lights out. And um, it's so bad, it sounds like I'm torturing this animal. I mean, well, I think the first thing is old, really old. You, you get some kind of just weird thing like that, and you haven't changed anything. You've got to make sure there's something medically wrong with the animal. You always have, it's the same thing like with a nonverbal person with autism. They've been good, now all of a sudden they got, you know, they're uh, hitting uh, people or whatever. You've got to rule out a hidden painful medical problem. The vets and maybe, tried, excuse me. Okay. The vets tried everything. And she's just thrown up her hand. She said, I have no idea why he's doing this. And he's, and he's fine the rest of the time? Mm-hmm. He's fine all day. He sleeps because he's an older cat. And, when you, and it's when you turn out the light he does this? Um, yes, but I tried leaving the light on all the time, okay. and he still howls. Is it at a certain time night. of day he howls? Or? Yes, at night. And he does it even if the light's on? Yes. And it's only in one particular place in the, in the house that he does it? Yes. It's only in one hallway at one certain point in the hallway. I wonder if he had something happened where he, something hurt him at, at, at some point in that hallway. Or maybe he's, um, um, you know, maybe got arthritis or something and had a, had some kind of a, painful episode right there in that hallway and then he remembers that and then the cat doesn't know he's, he he associates the hallway with that now what if you just keep him out of that hallway at night just put him somewhere else so he's not in that hallway it's the main <clears throat> main hallway in the apartment <laughs> well what if you just kept him in your bedroom at night okay I mean, I'm just, trying, I'm just trying to figure out something simple to do that, uh, and if he needs his litter box, then bring the litter box. In. All right. Yeah. If he still, no. I'll try it, but if he still howls, can I call you? So, okay. Well, okay. Now, you, you see, you haven't told me all the information. I thought he just howled in the hall hallway. 
Yeah, he does. But he but also ho howls when you hold him. No, no, no. I said, I'll try the bedroom. Why don't you try routine? It? And if he still howls, can I call you? Okay, I'll give. Um, since this is a real, this is a, I'll give you a kind of. Real, I'm reluctant to give my phone number out on the webcast. I'll give it to you when up afterwards okay. at the book table. Thank you. Okay. Dr. Granite, I'd like to thank you. Uh, we benefited from you. We're very honored that you took the time. And here's a token of your stay today, the George Brown Good Memorial Lecture Series. Thank you. She'll, Dr. Granite will be available out in the lobby for a book signing. Thanks. <laughs>